All right, everyone. This is the second day of the advent of code through in Erlang through some ad hoc unedited video with uh, a terminal and nothing else but a microphone and then a quick way to pause stuff. This is a high budget setup. And so, uh, yeah, we've got the first problem solved earlier today because this is recorded the 2nd of December as well as uh, the first video was. And I'm gonna see how bad I can be at this stuff. So, big improvement over the previous video. I have figured out how to save a file directly from my text browser, which is W3M in case you're wondering. So let's see what this problem is. All right, the 1202 alarm on the radio. Uh, an elf is explaining how to handle the situations. Don't worry, that's perfectly normal. And then the ship computer bursts into flames. That sounds as a regular day with computers to me. So there's magic smoke that escapes. The computer runs the int code programs like gravity assist. The int code programs a list of integers separated by comma, commas like 1003, blah, blah, blah. Okay, this is based on opcodes. And opcodes essentially, uh, this is a class of problem that is super frequent in uh, the advent of code. At least it was in 2017 when I last ran them. And they ask you to write what is essentially a small validator or a small interpreter for a program that they have. So at least they seem to only have three opcodes, 1, 2, or 99. Upcode 1 is an addition, and it works from reading from two positions and stores a result in the third position. Okay, uh, so those are positions right now, which means that we will need to have mutable memory or simulate it. And this is one of the things I really, really dislike in a lot of these problems is that they just assume that you do have a lot of mutable memory, Erlang does not, but that's part of what makes these challenges interesting. All right, so first up code is an addition. You read from positions and store it in a third position. And so, okay. Uh, the first two indicate the positions from which you should read the input values and the third indicates where you should store it. All right, so three addresses, one up code. Uh, they give a little example, 10 positions and then a 20 and the values and a 30. We don't necessarily know what the positions are right now. Uh, I'm curious to see if they're gonna do it as a kind of tape as a Turing machine, because that's what they've done in the past. Upcode 2 works exactly like upcode 1, but it multiplies the two values, so we have additions and multiplications, all right? Again, the three integers after the upcode indicate where, uh, the th yeah, the three integer, where the inputs and the outputs are, not their values. All right, once you're done processing an upcode, you move to the next one by stepping four positions. That's acceptable. Okay, so I'm guessing that this is an addition of whatever is at position 9 at position 10, and you store it at position 3, then this is a multiplication, and blah, blah, blah. All right. Uh, the save program multiple lines, that's what they did. So they split it into these operators. 99 means stop the program. Four integers, 1, 9, 10, 3, or positions, 0, 1, 2, 3, together to represent first upcode addition, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's the same translation. Step 4, that's another step we're going to be experimenting with these programs, I guess, because it's going to make things a bit easier. Uh, and the final states of a few more small programs. All right, additions where stuff goes. OK, uh, before trying it this time with the big puzzle output, I'm going to be playing with this shorter string right here. Um, and this is going to make a few things simpler I guess. So I'm going to export uh, an example zero function that's going to be under here. And we are going to work purely from that list of integers, which I'm going to assume is my input. So uh, the way these examples have set things up, the sequence of integers itself is the storage for what we have. And so the big question that we have with all of these is how are we going to store this stuff? Because essentially we have got the positions 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And the representations we can look into for this one would be something like this and moving along for whatever we have. Uh, 
the problem with these is that every time we want to change a value, we have to remove a number, rewrite part of the list, and all that stuff. And that turns out to be costly. And it's not going to be something that is anywhere close to optimal. Um, another option that is usually interesting is something called a zipper. And a zipper is a kind of buffer where I have the list of elements I have seen. So I could have seen the elements 9 and 1, and then I would have 10, 3, 2, 3 and whatever in that list. And the thing that you do is that, woo, I keep hitting keyboard shortcuts. If I go with that one and then I see the other element, I see 10 and whatnot. And what is interesting with the zipper like that uh, is that it gives you a very effective way to mutate a list and move through it but only if you insert where you are. The thing that we have here is this value nine that I have points me to uh, the 10th value in the list, which is going to be further in. And so I have to do a lot of random jumping. So the two other approaches that we could take is to just use an ETS table, but ETS is kind of cheating, annoying. It's kind of stateful. You have to settle up and turn it down. Um, we are going to cheat with an Erlang map where the position in the tape is simply going to be the key and the value is going to be the value of the tape at that place. And this is not necessarily going to be the fastest, it's still going to require us to do a lot of rewrites, uh, but it's going to be functional in its approach. Faster, uh, simpler than ETS and the process dictionary would also have been an option. But I'm going to skip on these and just straight up use a map. So this is going to be my input already converted to integers. And so the thing I'm going to do then is uh, write what would usually be a list fold to count all the elements because I want to have the indexes like that for each of them and inserting them in a map. So I'm going to fold from a list my function for the accumulator is going to be rather straightforward for that. Um, I'm going to have the integer itself and I'm going to store a double value in that one, which is going to be, let's call it the index instead and the map. And uh, the thing I'm going to do with it is for each new value I have, I, I'm going to store it in the map at a given index, here's the value. Um, and my accumulator is just going to be that value. I just need to increment the index at each iteration. And this should just give me a very simple map doing everything I need with it. Let me just put that into a single line. Um, the accumulator is going to be index zero an empty map, and that's going to give me my initial state. I'm going to pass my input to it. And my result is going to be the map is the one thing I care about. All right. So that's going to be, let's call it input to map input. And I'm going to just have the map here. That's going to make it a bit simpler to deal with. And I'm returning only the map. All right, step one in there, and I'm going to be able to reuse it in parts one and two. Uh, next one, I'm going to implement the little state machine for that one. Uh, so we are going to need to do a few things, right? We are going to need to read the opcodes. Uh, we are going to have to fetch values if it applies. And three, we are going to have to uh, do the four store values and five move the cursor. And this is going at to actually like reading the all of these if it applies are based on options that we have that are going to be a bit different. Uh, we are going to have to define, let's call it our program. And we start at position zero and we have a map. This is our program, this is our memory. And we're going to be recursive. 
uh, at position Z, at the given position P and given a map, I want to read the opcode. Okay, yeah. So just call it opcode, it's going to be simpler that way. And we are going to make decisions based on that opcode. So uh, I'm going to actually name the opcodes to be a bit simpler. And as with all recursive cases, uh, as I mentioned in the first one, first video, uh, you need to have the base case. And the final opcode for that one was an exit opcode. And I'm going to quote them in a single string. And if that happens, uh, what's the program supposed to do? Uh, I'm guessing we're just going to have to return the memory. So I'm going to return the map. Uh, I don't think we need the current position, but that's going to be the end of our function. And oh, we might want to add a step here, which is going uh, transform the map into a list again, because it might make it easier. We'll see what we need. Um, and then if I have the addition, it will be... Uh, Let's apply addition on a given tercer and a given map. And for multiplication. And the, th the reason I'm doing these little things here, um, separating them is that I want to really make a distinction between how the thing is implemented and how it's going to run for all of these. So uh, for each one of these, what I'm assuming for the application is that I'm going to get a new cursor and a new map. And I'm going to get this for each of them. And I'm not super careful what form I'm in, but... And this is just the actual, you know, recursive step is separated from, applica uh, from the application of every operation from reading and understanding an opcode and something like that. So if I have an upcoded position T and a map, I assume that I always get the right position. And if I recall correctly, maps get B um, is going to give me all of these. And so if I get the value one, I'm returning the addition. Value two is the multiplication. This is not the shortest code you can write, but I don't really care about that. I want something where the structure makes sense to me. Uh, and that only gives me the opcode. So next we have the apply addition B map. Uh, the cursor for the next one is actually just... I just had a little news flash in my head here, which... Uh, if I go read the thing is that I only move to the next step for each one of these. I don't need to return a new cursor, right? It's always going to be one plus one becomes two. Then I read the next program and yeah. So the thing I'm going to do is that uh, advancing the pointer for the thing is always going to be just P plus one on these, I believe. Uh, let's see the spec. Two position result, integers. The position words of one put. Right, so upcode exactly. Once you're done, move to the next one by, oh, stepping forward, four positions. Right, right, right. And so that should be a plus four on this. Problem, oh yeah. You know what? Let's just. We'll make this a bit clearer already because we're going to apply the addition and then we're going. Yeah, that's going to be here. Let's turn this into something a bit more direct. I apply. Uh, Here we go. That's going to be simpler because when I'm done, I'm done. I just return. Otherwise, it's always going to be plus four, but based on each upcode and how many operands it had. So you could have something that just, I don't know, negate, negates a value or something that you could just 
change the pointer differently than how it's being implemented for these. Um, okay, so let's apply the addition. So we've got the pointer zero and the position, uh, we've got five digits in there, right? So we've got the opcode, we've got A, B, and then we've got the right destination on these. So um, if I make them relative, it's going to be P, P plus one, P plus two, and P plus three. So I'm going to just get that right away. Um, do. So uh, AP is P plus one, BP is P plus two. two. I'm a good typist. And the return pointer is P plus three. I can get all of these in. And the return pointer, I actually don't need it right now, is equal to the map for this. So, all right. Uh, and I will just have to write back in the map at P plus three. So RP is equal to, which it should be existing. So I'm going to use here, uh, Erlang maps have two operands. If you're not super aware, or it's not fresh in memory. This always write. This updates assuming the value is already there. So it's a bit more effective. And because there is a tape, if I'm going out of bounds, there's clearly a problem with the program. So I'm just going to do these that way. Uh, so let's make this a bit more compact because I like, I like things to be a, a bit neater here. Oop. There then it's easier to copy paste without feeling bad when we do the multiplication. And now they're roughly the same, uh, which means that I could have really probably extracted the logic about uh, which pointers to read from and everything uh, differently into a third function, which could be like get pointers or something like that with P and the map. Uh, actually, yeah. Let's call it get ops because it's very much non descriptive. And the thing that you're returning here could be A, B, and RP, for example. And now, but you know, it would be roughly the same, not a lot of line saving. So don't care for this one right now. Uh, so I've got the multiplication. It's not being used. That's fine. Uh, why is my, oh yeah, that's basic syntax. Cool thing. Uh, apply multiplication, apply addition, unused. That's good. Not a problem. Upcode, unused. Syntax error. Yes, semicolon. There we go. So this could be a working example. We'll see if that works. I'm guessing that it's going to explode for some reason, but um, not running the base one. I'm going to be running a uh, day two example. Oop, is that not what I called it? Oh, it's day zero two. Great. That accurate typing. And I do get a problem. Oh, what's the problem? The maps get blah, 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 blah. Let's see. I do have a little page with the documentation for these and maps get. Maybe I just flip the operands for that one. Get key map should be the thing that's in there. All right. So but that's a key and that's a map and I'm asking for 12. 12 is out of bounds. So I did break the thing and I failed it at line 38. So line 38 is reading the opcode but I am starting at zero, so that should be, oh, did I reach the end of the output? So if I'm at the end of the map, what is supposed to happen on this one? I'm guessing that I'm going to wrap at the first value, but we'll see. Uh, 
let's see with the example program what they end up doing. Contains 30, respectively. This is stored at position 0. The next up code 2. All right, so. That key at 12, and I actually broke out of this properly. So 1, 9, 10, 70. I'm going to add a little debug information. Let me get into my rebar config. I'm going to just get recon going in that one, and I'm going to use it for tracing. So we're going to do some interactive debugging. And I'm going to trace all the freaking thing in day 02. All the function calls, all the arguments. Uh, let's do 100 steps. And I want the scope to be local because I want private functions to also be output. Oh, yeah. Um, day 02, it has been unloaded. Now it's visible. Let's call my day 02 example. All right. So we've got the full execution for that one. Um, so we're starting with day 0, uh, just in putting the map in there. And that's the first input for this. Input to map, input to map. What did I do? Okay. 199. So I'm breaking on the first opcode because I probably messed up the initialization of the thing then. I should be starting at zero. I've got the input to map. X plus one, I'm storing at the original index. That's good. Index plus one is the right thing. The map is good. So I'm going to input to map should be all right. My first cursor should be, oh God, bad refactoring. Here we go. New map is not needed anymore. We're just going recursive. Yeah, so the reason why I found that out is I just reread myself, but uh, if we are going through the uh, trace output in there, the fact that this is a font zero something like that tells me that it's an anonymous function and the only one I have is the one where I'm doing my new input for all my values that I'm inserting in the index. And so I had the failure on the first upcode I was reading at some place. And th that told me that, yeah, breaking some of the values that I was having. So let's recompile, retry the example. And so I do have the resulting map here. It didn't crash. I'm going to do my thing where I turned the um, uh, program to list. And we're going to return it in the same way that it was. And program to list is just going to take a map, obviously. Uh, we're going to do it simple. Maps to list of the map. And this is going to give me a bunch of uh, keys and values like that in a list. So I'm just going to uh, sort that value. And then I'm going to take only the value and drop the key. So no key, only the value in that list of sorted things. And that's going to be my output for the program. So if I rebuild and try it, I do get this value here. And was that what was expected? Let's see. Uh, Okay, one nine ten seventy. I do not have the same result. So at least good thing I'm trying with that one because I am breaking things here. Two nine seventy thirty. I don't want well, one nine seventy. It's going to produce. This is stored at position zero. Yeah, I'm supposed to be having thirty five hundred when I get to a different opcode which is interesting. 
So am I returning the right maps? I'm applying the multiplication. I'm applying the updates on these. So at least I'm returning the new map properly. Then I'm passing the map to that. The opcode is in there. The pointer is advanced. Hmm. All right, let's add little bits of debug information program list map. And we're just going to do that at every step and get it easy. So let's compare them to what I'm expected to do. First step, one, nine, ten, zero. That's the break in one. One, nine, ten, three, two, 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 one, eleven, three, fifteen. So the first one is correct. Then, oh, oh, yeah, I get it. I just get it. I got the position for that one, but the thing, oh no, that's right. The thing for that one is not the value, yeah. I'm going to do properly. And hopefully things will be clear. So what I have here are only the pointers. This is all right. The values of A and B are, I'm getting the values properly. Yeah, I think I was doing it fine. Hold on a second. Let me reason about that a little bit. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think that's it, right? Those represent the positions of the two input, 9 and 10, and I'm using the pointer values directly to do it. So we're going to get the operands, and those are only positions. I do get the values for these at each of the pointers. So that's going to be A, B, and the response pointer there. When I store the value, let me just read carefully. So the thing that I did here is that, yeah, I read this as the value itself, and I'm getting the value, the pointer of the value is not AP or BP, that's right. So the thing that I should be getting is AP is equal to P plus one map. BP is map. And those are not the same things as having the values that I have. And the return pointer is still going to be P plus three on that one. But getting A and B will be different using these now because I'm using the pointer for the level of indirection that I wanted for this. So let's work these and and that's going to give me a b and rp as a value for this and the only thing that's changing is actually the application of the function and let's see if that gives me something that's more reasonable no it does not give me something that's more reasonable what have i done So I'm getting the two pointers values. I'm getting the two values from the pointers and putting them in there and returning the right value for the last one. I'm storing these. That's exactly the same result I had before. Oh no, that's right. It's different. I'm an idiot. I just don't know how to read my own results. So I do get the value here of 3,500 and what should be after a 2, 3, and 11. 2, 3, 11, nope. Almost there. So I'm not storing, oh, I'm starting at a pointer zero and same layer of indirection is required for the return pointer. So RP is maps get P plus three on a map and off we go. And that's why it's nice to factor it out in a different function because now I'm fixing all my operands at once. All right, finally, makes sense. Let's try it with the other ones that we have in terms of examples to make sure that we do get something similar. So I'm going to comment out that little input 
input is now this little list. I compile. And that gives me 31142560099. 31142560099. So the 30 was that the proper. I have extremely bad. Yep, yeah, that's good. Okay. We now run the program. What is value left at position zero? That's going to be simpler. And I learned from my previous one that I can now save the file to the 02p1. And now I have my entire problem statement there. Now what we have to do is parse our cool input. Uh, as you have probably noticed, it's all comma separated digits. So it's going to be very similar to what we did in day one. Let me go do some copy pasting because I'm a bit lazy on that one. Um, string, blah, 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 that's good. I'm going to turn that. And the ints are going to be a list of integers. I'm just going to replace the lexeme here. It's not a line break, it's the comma that we're using. And then all I have to do is run uh, map is input to map ints. And program to list right away. All right. And let's see how that goes. R3 compile. Advent run day two. Oh, uh, let's trim the integers. So string, not just the integers, but the list. I don't want a line break at the end that I had there. All right, so position zero. Oh, I forgot to remove my output from there. There we go, debug in production. That makes more sense, and that's the value I'm reading here, 29891. All right, let's submit this value and see what we get. Hopefully, it's correct. Jesus, I failed on that one as well. That's not great. I'm usually, yeah, that's the intent of the experiment anyway. And that's supposed to be at position zero. Oh, before running the program, because it crashed. That's me not reading instruction. All right. Um, replace position one with the value 12 and position two with the value two. So I'm going to go to my map here. And uh, not in the example, let's get rid of that. Here, uh, this is going to be a temporary map. The actual map is going The value one should be 12. Is that correct? And the value two should be two. All right. And now we know how to read instructions. Compile, run, and it's a different number. It's much bigger, oh, somewhat bigger than what we had before. So let's replace the text for that one, submit the result, and now we got it because we read the actual problem statement properly. All right, part two. I'm sure it's going to be painful. Um, all right, computer seems to be working correctly. Well, no, I mean, it's the same one that was a problem, but yeah. Oh, really code, many more features. All right. Complete gravity-assisted move for this mission. We should succeed. Settle on some term in tomorrow. Right. And just stay for the computer's memory. When you want to make sure to start by initializing the memory to the program's value. The position memory is calling an address. Yeah, I used pointers already. Um, Upcodes like one to mark beginning of the instructions. Those values are left during upcode instructions parameters. All right. Yeah. So you know what? Let's align with what they have. Um, so upcode, that's fine. Well, where they called instructions, right? So I'm just going to upcode is going to be replaced by instruction in this file. And the others where uh, there are not ops, they are parameters. So operands are Parameters on that one. I should have just replaced it the same. Does it still work fine? Yep. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, there's the upcode. Ah, oh, god damn it, it's an upcode again. Yeah. It's an instruction. Yes. Yeah, I'm just going to swap these. I want to have the proper terminology because I have a feeling that they might be reusing that map in later ones compared to what they said. So the program, they should be actually getting the instruction, but yeah, we'll see what we do. There's probably a better way to do it. We'll rework it in due time. Up. Uh, yeah, just instruction, instruction pointer starts at zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an IP value is the pointer for the instruction. Until you add more, this is always four. We'll rework it in due time. Oh, okay, where is the output though? Is this only the first value? The input should still be provided to the program replacing the values that were shown just that before. Okay, so they're going to be between 0 and 99 inclusive. Not too bad. Uh, once the program is halted, the output address 0 just like before. Okay, so this is going to be a search that we have to do. And we're going to do a brute force to get it started. It's going to be rather simpler. We'll still keep the same temporary map. Um, do we still have the same input file though? We can still get, yeah, it hasn't changed, but I'm going to, um, yeah, let's keep the same input. It's not a big deal. Same thing, same thing. Program to list is still there, but we're going to delay uh, the result. That, what is the result they're actually asking for? Find input noun and verb. Oh, the value in address 1 is called a noun, and the value in address 2 is called verb. Okay. So what we want are the two of them. Zero. What is 100 times noun plus verb? All right. So we're not going to do a program to list on this one. Instead, I'm going to get what is... Uh, this is the noun, two is the verb, and they want a hundred times noun plus verb, 12 and two, okay, but they want the same order first round. All right, now the thing that we have to do is search. So, we are going to need to have all the different possibilities for the values of 1 plus 1, uh, 1 plus 2. The thing that's interesting is that currently we only have addition and multiplication, right? And so the values that we have are all in between 0 and 99 inclusive. They can be repeated, uh, but the thing that's interesting is that all the, va all the pairs that we have tried don't need to be tried more than once. Because 0 and 99 and 99 plus 0 are going to be exactly the same. Uh, and so we can do them all in a kind of lazy manner, depending on how we generate all our possibilities. Because all the candidates could just be like 0, 1, 0, 2, and so on. Uh, 0 is a special case. Oh no, it's not a special case because of additions. So we have to try all of them. But because they're commutative, we only have to test all, half of them. Um, we can generate them extremely lazily by using, you know, uh, A and B and just going like the sequence of 0 to 99 is A and the sequence of 0 to 99 for B. Uh, since we don't necessarily need to replay all of them for the same level. The thing we can do is cheat with sorting the lists here 
And what that will give us is that all the pairs are going to be the same. And what we can do is list u sort. That's going to give us all the unique values in each of them. Right? It would be more effective, truly, to uh, you know generate the pairs without cheating on these. And maybe we can do that. Let's see. If I start with the pairs and I have the value 99, 99, then I know I'm done. So that's all right. If I have a pair, the value 0, 0, that's something. A and B. Uh, and I'm going to do... I'm going to test 99 until 99, that's fine. But I need to skip all of these where um, whenever A is greater than B, I'm going to just go. Oh, wait. Let's see how that works. I'm not actually sure that what I'm doing is fine. If the greatest one is B, so that's going to test it. Let's get the logic fine with the thing. I'm sure it, it, it is easy to do, but I just don't want to be juggling too many balls at the same time. I'll get back a bit later to fix that last one and do more efficient generation, if it makes sense. So let's start with the search program because why not? Um, so I'm going to say that I'm going to get only a resulting map for this one because I'm going to That's going to be simpler. Search map. And the values I want to have are going to be uh, this output. I'm going to search for this value in the map and then return the value and the result. And so the search is going to be done by having the uh, good result and the map. And let's give it all the freaking pairs. No lazy programming. I don't know how big the input is, but it's probably not big enough that it's going to be a problem. Uh, so. Temporary map, the heads and the tails, and I assume there's always going to be a valid value because otherwise the problem is not solvable. And I'm going to have A, B. Oh, wait, no, because those are lists. That's a new map. Then I run the program from zero and the map. And what I want to look is value case program of at value zero. Do I get the good result? And if so, return. Wait, wait, wait. The values that they want is it the original ones or they want the final ones? The non verb that caused a program to produce the output. So they want the initial ones, I guess. Uh, so this step is not required, it's just going to be the noun and the verb directly in a tuple instead of a list. And just A, B, and if it's not good, then search for the good program in the temporary map with the rest of them. Let's see how that goes. 
So we probably have an example from what they gave us a bit earlier, though. Do we? No, we don't. Let's try and see. We broke, which is a good thing, because it means that I failed without having to input the program into the other thing. All right, let's see. What did I mess up on that one? Is it because some programs are allowed to be invalid? Nope. For mm -hmm. pressing the values one and two, just like before, this program printing interest one is counted now. The value placed in two is the verb, each two values are nine one exclusive. Address zero, it's still good. Make sure you first reset the memories program. I think that this is fine just because we're using a temporary map all the time and that's the one where we have the raw result so that's good all right interesting Position one is A, position two is B. Am I reading them fine? Yes. Address is one and two. The noun is one, the verb is two. I'm starting from zero with the map of my initialized program. But my search blows up. and see what we get at least. I'm just always outputting just a tuple that way because that's the only output I have and I just want to see where I'm at in there. Actually, let's do it with spaces instead. I don't need to have the entire thing. Boom. All right, so I did go through all the freaking values. So maybe my optimization was being premature. And the thing I'm going to do is just directly use these. It shouldn't be, but it makes sense that, it, oh yeah, because the, oh God damn it. Yeah, I get what that is. The other things that I have in the program, essentially, uh, you know, there's a list of instructions. Those can point to the values of one and two, whatever they want. So that was indeed a premature optimization on that one to try to do it that way. Because if they point to these values, it's not true that only the positive or negative values are going to be that way. All right, so I'm going to use this instead. Uh, that's good. I'm going to drop my debugging information. Oops, that was supposed to, yes, be that way. Ha. Ah. Now we get a result, and that was still, yeah, about not too bad in terms of time. That's, uh, is it in milliseconds or microseconds that I have them? That's in milliseconds, 6,000 milliseconds. That doesn't make sense. I probably have the wrong unit on these. It didn't take six seconds. All right, anyway, let's try and see if, oh, Wait, no. That's my result. That's not the time. I'm using the wrong function. Yes, that's 75 milliseconds. That's short enough. Let's see if that works. All right, it worked. It worked. Uh, if we wanted to be a bit more effective that way, because right now we're generating the entire list of pairs, and that is not very good let's take a second and optimize that we're just going to do them iteratively instead it's going to be much simpler so that's going to be a and b when a is smaller than or equal to well just smaller than 100 and b is smaller than 100 as well 
So this is my guard clause, and if it breaks, then I know because it explodes. And I'm just going to be using next a, b, that one. And the next value, I'm going to calculate it quite easily. Uh, yeah, I guess I can do it that one. So the counter of doing it that way is kind of more painful to do. You can't just iterate through all of them super easily. Yeah, we can actually. So so a b actually my stopping position is going to be. Yeah, let's do it this way. When B is 99, then I'm going to A plus 1 and 0 on that case. Um, otherwise, A and B, I'm just going to go A and B plus, plus 1. Let's B. That should be plenty enough. Here we go. And we have cut down, oh wow, three milliseconds. That was really worth it. That was an optimization worth my time. Uh, and yours as a viewer. All right. So, uh, with this done, the entire search, the entire result, and the good result. I think that concludes everything for today. So come back next time for day three. Thank you and have a good day.